Welcome back to The Soapbox. I'm your host, Cindy Sheehan. We've been on a little soapbox hiatus while um, Dakota Lily and I have been working on our new video cast, She Lily. Check it out at substack.cindysheehan soapbox newsletter substack. But today we're going to welcome back our dear soapbox friend, Don DeBar. And Don and I will be talking about the contradiction between prosecuting Donald Trump for writing a check to an alleged porn star and that George Bush, Dick Cheney, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are running around free, peacefully and prosperously um, while they've killed millions of people and they're not being prosecuted. So stay tuned and we'll be right back with Don DeBar. Hi, uh, Welcome back to the soapbox. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I haven't really done too many soapboxes this year, as you've probably noticed. I know you're she lillying all over the place. <laughs> since, you're my, yeah. since you're my engineer. Yes. You know, I've been writing a lot on Substack, and um, we've been doing a video cast once a week, Dakota and I, called She Lily. Right. But, you know, I do, I have reached out to some people, you know, to be guests, and, you know, it's just not the right time, or haven't heard back, or whatever, but... Anyway, I thought of you when I thought of this topic uh, to come back on the show. It's been several months since since you've been on the show, I think. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, what I have been noticing is that um, with this uh, indictment of Donald Trump for, you know, paying off uh, Stormy Daniels, uh, who I think was a porn star. He had an affair with I'm you know I'm not sure I don't care but he paid her off before the 2016 campaign so I essentially gave her hush money which I I'm not sure if that's even illegal I mean it was a contract that they both entered into you know I don't think he used the um, the force of the state or uh, you know any kind of uh, that kind of coercion to stop her from speaking and um anyway i just i just feel like it's so straight and i was talking to dakota lily the other day and i was just like i'm not even sure why he was impeached two times honestly i, I don't i don't I know, know what the reasons for that were I know. and you know george bush wasn't impeached and barack obama wasn't impeached and bill clinton was but you know basically not for war crimes and crimes against humanity. That's right. You know, that's for sure. But anyway, I was watching something from Fox News in New York right before we talked. And most people are questioning this uh, persecution. They're saying that it's politically motivated. And, of course, the liberals are saying, oh, no, it's, it's not politically motivated. motivated. Nobody's o- above the law. But I saw one guy, um, obviously a liberal, who had a sign that said indict Trump and or arrest Trump, whatever. And he said, yeah, he thinks that <clears throat> Trump needs to be held accountable, accountable for the absolute anarchy and tyranny he brought to this country. But that's not why he's being indicted. Right. right. Okay, your comments. Well, first, I'd like to just take note of the fact that after you've made 900,000 She Lilies and other video projects, that the next time you finally go to audio uh, only with uh, no face on TV, you'd say, oh, it's safe for Don now. <laughs> Hey, so I, uh, you I've, should see the way I look, okay? I've it's got a face made for... <laughs> it's 7.30 in the morning, uh, and, <laughs> you know, I'm still eating my oatmeal, so... It's a face made for radio. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, I, I know where you're coming from, that's for sure. So, um, you know, it's an interesting thing to note, first of all, that there were two impeachments of Trump. After a rolling out of the crimes high crimes and misdemeanors that he supposedly committed, including urinating on the first bed in Moscow or whatever the hell else he was supposed to have done and grabbing that uh, kitty cat thing and whatever, um, that there was only one impeachment of of Trump until his last week in office. 
And that began December of 2019, which is like two weeks before December 18th, two weeks before the, the 2020 election season. And the articles were abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. He was acquitted February 5th. So they started the election season with Trump on trial in front of the Senate, basically. And uh, then everything that happened that year. And then about a year and a month later, on January 13th, was the second impeachment. And that was completely pointless. He was going to not be president in a week. The purpose of impeachment, to be clear, is in essence to remove someone who has committed some high crime or misdemeanor in the opinion of the first, the uh, indicting uh, uh, agency, which is the House of Representatives, and then the trial court, which is the Senate, uh, some uh, uh, high crime or misdemeanor. And to remove from them the cloak of immunity afforded by the office so that they can be properly tried for the alleged crime and or misdemeanor. So, in the case of the second impeachment, it was pointless since that cloak would be removed one week to the day later by operation of law. Um, This is even after the attempted insurrection. So the danger of somehow him keeping that cloak on beyond January 20th, 2021, was zilch. It was clearly a political move. And it was a political move to bury Trump in the aftermath of whatever controversy, real controversy, existed both around uh, January 6th, although you wouldn't know there was a controversy following the media on that point anywhere, including Fox, Right. And around the election 2020, um, that, that if he, he had no voice, because this is the guy that, who, again, we just reiterated, you know, another two weeks worth of bile about uh, before we took it to the Senate. So th- th- these entire proceedings are fundamentally political. We talk about the actual things. It's just like. The challenges to him and the the, paint, the painting of, of Trump, quote unquote, in the popular culture in the in the media, it, it had nothing. His repulsiveness as a political figure, and he and Hillary Clinton are apparently the two most hated characters on the scene, at least for a good part of the time we're talking about, according to all polling data. Um, it's not over him; his actual racism. It's not not over his actual misogyny. It's not over his actual whatever other horrible characteristics they ascribe to him and he wears like a logo in the public imagery because those things do not distinguish him one iota from anybody else standing on the stage next to him pointing at him and going, "Ah," or whatever it is Donald Sutherland does in that little clip. These things are part of the landscape of America. And so instead, you have this whole like formal thing that has is detached from the essence. You, you could hold Hillary Clinton out. People did. That's why they didn't vote, by the way, in 2016. Um, you could hold Hillary Clinton out <clears throat> equally, perhaps, not perhaps, certainly more so as a as a racist as a public racist then you could hold out donald trump donald trump's primary <clears throat> act of public racism in my view i mean i'm not black maybe i'm wrong maybe other people see it differently to me his primary uh, act as an instrument of that was the editorial he placed in the times and wherever the hell else the boston globe etc calling for the execution of the so-called Central Park Five. I don't know if you're familiar with that case, but there was a case. Yeah. Yeah, the Central Park jogger, quote-unquote. That's who they talk about. The the kids that were innocent and railroaded into prison for a decade, they don't talk about. They talk about the jogger. And so Hillary Clinton, while that was going on, rode 
that same sentiment, marshalling legislation on behalf of her husband through the Congress that has a body count. Those bodies, a lot of them are still in prison. Right, right, for sure. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to even have a conversation about a lot of this stuff without looking at the heart of each of, each of the individual elements of it. And so these are two of them. One is the, the history of the impeachment scenarios. Um, and which which were clearly political. Yet, you know, I don't know which aspect of the, uh, you know, and how deep to go into it. That they were talking about, and the first uh, inquiry that led up to the uh, the first impeachment attempt, supposedly Trump solicited Russian interference in the in the election to help him, and he invited uh, Zelensky to the White House to influence him into investigating Biden and to promote, right, 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 right. you know, I can't even read like Wikipedia for the claims because they're so loaded with uh, pejoratives and, and, you know, prejudicial adjectives. It's, instead of saying it to promote the, the idea that Ukraine, not Russia, was the interfering party in the 2016 election, it says to promote a discredited conspiracy theory that Ukraine, not Russia, was behind interference in the 2016 election. Now, when they wrote that sh- nonsense <clears throat> back in uh, 2020 or whenever they put it into Wikipedia, who would have thunk that when you're sitting here talking about who bought influence in Washington, you'd be saying, is it Russia that we're bombing or is it Ukraine that has an open checkbook in Washington? Right. I mean, sure. if, if this was a conspiracy to promote Russian influence in Washington, I think it didn't work. <laughs> exactly. Well, it worked for a few years. But anyway, the thing that I, like, have noticed or that especially touches me is that Trump is being um, indicted. And we don't know. You know, we don't know. Right. Still today is Wednesday, um, yeah, the 22nd. March twenty second yeah. that we're that we're recording this. That you know, for, as of Friday, it was a big deal. Like, and right. so when you think of something like this as a Friday that dominates uh, social media and cable news for the whole weekend, you're wondering what is really that they're hiding. Actually, you know, why why is this a big distraction? Because he's going to be arrested on Monday or Tuesday or what? And here it is Wednesday. He's still not arrested. But um, and Trump even played into this hype right and so then then you but i'm while this is happening on the 20th uh march 20th was the 20th anniversary of the invasion shock and awe or like i like to call shocking and awful of iraq and so here we are trump allegedly or he did i guess paid off stormy daniels and, um, you know, or was it Jennifer Flowers or, you know, yep. whatever. And um, here, Bush, Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld. I could sit here, you know, for hours naming all of the neocons in the Democrat Party, in the Republican Party, that were contributors of this false narrative that destroyed a country, killed over a million people, destroyed a country that was already teetering on the edge from, you know, years of sanctions and bombings. You know, a lot of people don't know that under the Clinton regime, not only were there harsh sanctions, but the UN was bombing on a weekly basis under the aegis of the United States, obviously. Right. And, um... So 20 years later, uh, over a million people are dead. People are still dying in Iraq. Uh, Children are still being born with birth defects. Uh, Children are dying from um, blood cancers, hard tumor cancers because of the depleted uranium and other toxins left there. The oil fields are completely controlled by global um, you know, oil companies and Bush and Cheney are walking around free. 
Like they're not war criminals, not like they're not mass murdering psychopaths. And that's the issue that has been really, as you can tell, upsetting me this week. Yeah. If, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I want to try to tread with respect and love around this area because people don't conceive of these things as real. Right. Well, it's real to me. I yeah, mean, I, I have know pictures you, of my dead son I know. all over my room. I know. I know you. I, I know. Um, let, let, on that point, let's back out and just take a large, you know, sort of a medium uh, survey of the scape. Um, we're, we're looking at the indictment against Putin. This indictment, to call it an indictment, this comic book thing that's going on out, out of The Hague. The Hague is sort of like a pimple on the arse of uh, imperialism. Right. Um, this is like a hair growing out of it, and that they didn't wipe clean last time. Um, the, uh, the allegation at the bottom is that um, before uh, beginning the genocidal bombing of this, that, or the other place in Ukraine... Uh, Putin sent in the troops to steal all the children so they could, you know, child uh, enslave them or whatever, or peddle them around, etc. Um, instead, of course, what we know is that these these are people who have been shelled for eight years by the Kiev government with tax, U.S. taxpayer-funded uh, shells, uh, killing children, um, at, and uh, actually at the exhortation of then Mayor. Uh, uh, then uh, president, I hate to call him president, Poroshenko, uh, who was saying on television, their children will live in basements because we'll bomb them. What what Putin actually did, quote unquote, what Russia actually did was provide a safe haven to people before they got uh, engaged in a war over these cities to liberate them for the people that lived in it at the eight year long request, practically demand of the people in those for help. On the other hand, uh, the people raising the question are the political uh, brothers and sisters and, and uh, I don't know, fellow team members, like in a team of mules, of, uh, of Madeleine Albright, who, when when uh, asked about this interregnum between uh, Iraq War One and Two under Bill Clinton, uh, having produced a body count of 400,000 dead children with sanctions, the answer to her, to the, her answer to the question, was it worth it, was, well, you know, it's really difficult, but uh, yeah, it was worth it. So in other words, I'm admitting to killing 400,000 children in an illegal war in Iraq uh, because it was worth it from my geopolitical standpoint to let's indict this guy for pulling the children out of the way, out of harm's way, before engaging in a war on the terrain they happen to be inhabiting. Right. That's the logic of the thing here. And, you know, that has to be looked at, too, when we're discussing. So on the one hand, let's indict Trump. And what's that indictment about? Uh, well, I, I, you mentioned correctly, of course, they're, they're now... Uh, 10:52 a.m. Eastern Time, Eastern Daylight Time, um, March 22nd, Wednesday. No indictment yet, and we're hearing from people now. If one comes, because some people are floating the possibility it won't come after all, <clears throat> that if one comes, um, it may not come till next week. You uh, know what, Don? Yeah. I just say I just think that the reason that I think that there won't be an indictment is because the Democrats and liberals need Trump. Trump is their lifeline to right. power. That's right. I agree with so you. So if he's in jail, <laughs> right. what, you know, what is their lifeline then? And, and I just think that the Democrats, if they have like a political strategist that, uh, you know, the, the a bureau of stupid things to do, you know, it just, I, I don't know. It just, yeah, it, it's like this complete political circus. While real crimes are going unpunished. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. It, it, it. Look, but I thought that when Trump was no longer president, there was going to come a point in time when they couldn't blame stuff on him anymore because, you know, okay, three months later, 
there's runaway inflation or whatever. Well, it looks like it's Biden's fault, but it's Trump. He left the conditions in place where this was inevitable. You know, there's a point in time when that all that nonsense sunsets. The clock yeah. has run, okay? And now this is you. And, um, you know, I thought there was going to be a point in time when these people would shut the hell up about Trump because he's no longer president. No. But that hasn't come yet. We're still they having can't. this conversation now. Mm-hmm. Right, they can't. Yeah, they got nothing else. What They need a diversion because they're deeply involved up to both elbows uh, in really nasty, nefarious, painful, harmful stuff. And if they can't blame it on somebody else, people are going to start looking at who's actually doing it. And, of course, we know who's doing it. At Trump. <laughs> well, you know, they can't, they don't have um, historical memories. Their, their historical memory just goes back to 2016. And that's where all of the problems started happening with the United States. It was this pristine um, <clears throat> beacon of democracy before uh, 2016. No violence, you know, no, no uh, banking, hanky-panky, no support of Wall Street, no uh, wars or war crimes or crimes against humanity. That just all started on 2016, and I'm thinking their memories are getting even shorter. Yeah. You know, they was like, uh, seems like a lot of them wake up every day and go on social media to find out what they're supposed to be outraged about that day. I agree. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. The, both the players and the observers, the teams yeah. of observers. You know, you got, it's, it's like looking at a high school football game from one of the goal line, one of the goal posts, like... Looking downfield, on the left, everybody's wearing blue. On the right, everybody's wearing red. On the field, there's red and blue people banging into each other and falling down and standing up and doing it again over and over, moving up and down the field. You don't have any idea what the hell they're actually doing it for. And um, and whenever something happens, everybody on one side stands up and, and cheers, and everybody on the other side you know, sits down with their head down, vice versa. So the talking points around the issue du jour um, all break that way, of course. And, and you can see them. If, if, if you have a, uh, a pair of accounts on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, for example, one of them as, you know, following one side, one following the other, you look at your feed in the morning, you can see what people are going to be arguing about on TV all day. That's true. In terms of pushback, because I didn't, it nev- never occurred to me there might not be an indictment till I saw this. This is a, a letter addressed to Alvin L. Bragg Jr., who is the district attorney of New York County. This is the guy that's going to indict Trump, by the way, the county prosecutor in Manhattan. Crazy. You know, wherever you live, <laughs> think about who the county prosecutor is there. They now claim the power to indict a former president for actions taken by them while they're either a candidate for the presidency or as president. If you think about that and look across the landscape of the United States, there's, I think, 3,033 counties in the United States, I think that's the right number. I have no idea. It's it's oh. about it's three thousand plus okay. or minus. Let's go about, with that number. Yeah, it's about sixty counties per state, roughly. Um, there's that many individuals who came to office many different ways, with none of the local power establishment members considering that this knucklehead that I put in office so I can continue to rob the, the public or whatever is ever going to be able to touch the president. So this is not like the most monumental you know, job placement I'm going to do as a party boss. It, suddenly, in place, you got 3,000 variables that can reach into next year's presidential election because this knucklehead decided he can go after Trump, run for office on that basis, and then embark on a hunting expedition, finally decide not to do it, get publicly exoriated by the power establishment in New York City for doing that. Somebody got to him, (laughs) etc. 
and then comes out with this, that we're going to go after Trump. Here's the basis of the case. So you got Stormy Daniel, whatever the hell she is. We use the language of the media at the moment. Uh, porn star, former porn star, I don't know, whatever that is. It could be a county commissioner or jurors, you could call a porn star. <laughs> um, and uh, Trump supposedly slept with her, you know, met her out back for a you know, quick whatever. Uh, who knows what? There's some kind of nefarious physical act or semi-physical act took place or allegedly took place. In any event, she was about to tell somebody by his mind that this happened while he was running for president. That, of course, is a PR problem for a presidential candidate, unless you're Bill Clinton, in which but case... who didn't know about it? I know. I mean, I, I don't even pay attention I know. to who who. Who cares? Who, but yeah. I, I kind of... I, I think I knew about that. Yeah, it's like, I, I don't care where you put that as long as you don't try to put it anywhere near me. Right. You know? <laughs> Otherwise, I don't, go go weave it outside, you know? Go. Well, and then he was running against uh, Hillary Clinton. I know! Now, I, if you want to, I know. like, bring up uh, philanderers, people who, and I think both Trump and Clinton, Bill, maybe yeah. Hillary... Are on uh, the Epstein uh, Lolita jet on the way to, um, you know, Rape Island. Right. I mean, it's just really effing ridiculous. And this is another thing, Don. And I'm sorry, we're probably getting a little bit off course. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm coming back to this. So go ahead, it's go wherever same, you want. It's the same thing. Is Hunter Biden is suing the. Um, the computer repair guy, I know. where he left his computers for violation of privacy, and so it's like, why are they like holding um, conservatives accountable for things that they can be objective, objectively proven that they've done or been worse? You know, look, it, it's not about the thing itself. That's what I'm saying. It's about the appearance of the thing. The essence uh -huh. of the thing. Appearance <laughs> of the thing. Yeah. Yeah, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, right. Want, yeah, 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 right. I, don't, don't give me too much mental imagery on the topic here, okay? Um, all right, so on point, though, what happens is uh, they, you know, they, they go after Trump, uh, attempting to paint him with this during the campaign. She, she comes to light. This, he supposedly, this is the allegation, pays her off. Um, and he doesn't file the payment to her with the FEC as a uh, election expense. They, in other words, say, we, 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 you might want to not have people think this about you for other reasons, like your wife, for example, smothering you with a pillow tomorrow because she found out you did this, because it might have impacted your public image for the campaign, we think this is a campaign finance violation to not disclose the expense that's the legal theory behind this and uh, this the fec actually ruled on the question and said it's not right well that's what i'm thinking like you said this little putz in new york county is yeah you know trying to indict him for something that that is allegedly a federal crime. Right. And the FEC, I want to say, the FEC, as someone who has uh, run in a federal election, they're really freaking stripped. I know. They're yeah. like, oh, you get a fine. <laughs> like, I don't know how many. And it's just because my campaign wasn't being intentionally, like, breaking laws. But we just didn't know because we were, yeah, yeah. you know. It's because we you ran against Pelosi. Campaigners or whatever. But we were. Yeah. Fine, 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 yeah, fine. Yeah. File your file your report like one minute past midnight, and you get this like five dot five thousand dollar fine or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And they're super strict. So if they said it wasn't a crime, what's you know this putz in New York County doing? Well, okay. There's a in, in addition. There's a bias built into the FEC, like is built into the boards of elections, and that is that they you know these instruments of power are fundamental ones. Um, and unless you have control of them, you don't have control of power. And mm -hmm. so uh, the reason that you were getting facing this, it may well be that they formally 
uh, go after people that aggressively across the board. But uh, in fact, certainly if you were to study it over a period of five or 10 years, you would see a bias. The reason he went after you so aggressively, so ritualistically, um, is that you ran against Nancy Pelosi. Right. Okay, and, and, and cut her some. And so you got to imagine now that the power, the institutions of power here are controlled by people that see Trump as a threat. He's the fundamental threat to their power in their eyes in a lot of ways. Whether you agree or not, whether that's a fact that he's a threat to their power, they perceive of him that way in, in an irrational, it's almost a delusional uh, level of fear that, that seems to operate it because it's across the board. You have Amy Goodman saying the same thing about Trump as uh, Brian Kilmott, what, what a knuckleheaded fox across MSNBC and CNN and all the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos, the New York Times, the, all of them. They all will tell you the same thing about some fundamental facts about Trump, some of which are not true. And believe me, that institution has control of the FEC, and that FEC did not indict him. Right. So that tells so you that's about really saying something. Yeah. It tells you about the it tells you about the merit of the case, as right. decided by the governing and policing institution. And so now you got this one of three thousand knuckleheads. You know, it could be, uh, I don't know, who's a county prosecutor in Hooterville, for example. Um, <laughs> it's going to take down, uh, you know, the, the, the leading presidential candidate a year before. You know, before. Hooterville is actually a place in California. Yeah, there's a real Hooterville? Yes, there really is. Um, and and there is also a real Pixley. Yeah, well, tell Sam and... Uh, Oliver and Lisa and <laughs> Je- all them and characters. Mr. And, and Mr. Ziffel. Yeah, Ziff. <laughs> Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them all I say. Hey. What are they like in Tulare County or something like that? Yeah, maybe yeah. the Tulare County. <laughs> yeah. Like so, so anyway, so you have these minor official who has no jurisdiction over federal election law um, and that is using a New York state law that um, would have expired except for his claim that the uh, New York State violation was done in order to promote or, or otherwise enable a federal violation that the federal jurisdictional agency said was not a violation. Putting together a kangaroo uh, uh, grand jury process uh, to indict this guy to keep him out of the... You'd say they want to charge him with a felony so he can't run. It'll impair his ability to run physically. To, uh, it'll impair it legally. That, that's what's going on right now. And this is uh, March 20, uh, 22nd now. So a letter is written to this guy, Bragg. This is Friday. This is the guy that's, you know, Trump is talking about is going to be indicting. And everybody knows the grand jury's been impaneled. And they're talking to Michael, uh, what's his face, Cohen, uh, Trump's uh, former lawyer, and some others that are, you know, that they're looking to use to hang Trump with. And so, so on the twentieth, there's a letter drafted from Jim Jordan, who is the chair on the House uh, Judiciary Committee, right. Brian Steele, who's the chair of the House Administration Committee. And James Comer, who's the chair of the committee, House Committee on Oversight and Accountability, each of whom have subject matter jurisdiction over this. Um, the uh, Committee on the Judiciary has jurisdiction over criminal justice matters. This is one. The Committee on House Administration has jurisdiction over matters concerning federal elections. This is one. And the Committee on Oversight and Accountability may examine any matter at any time under its charge. So these three chairs write a letter to our little pal Zeke down at the Manhattan DA's office and starts with this. Dear Mr. Bragg, you are reportedly about to engage in an unprecedented abuse of prosecutorial authority. The indictment of a former president of the United States and current declared candidate for that office. 
That's how it starts. Unprecedented, they're talking mm -hmm. historically, going back to 1790. Right. You're the first one to try this dumb nonsense. And then it goes into detail that if I got this letter, I'd like go close and lock all the locks on my front door, draw the shades, go into my bedroom, lock the door, get under the blanket, and say, oh boy, <laughs> something bad's about to happen. <laughs> And, and and what they do is they spell out basically the the facts of a case of false pro malicious prosecution, um, completely ultra vires you know outside of his authority activity, um, and, and 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 say basically you know we have to pursue this to to the end because this is a major threat to our entire constitutional order. That some knucklehead from Podunk can, even though New York City is not exactly Podunk, but it is, right. you know, in terms of looking at federal jurisdiction, right? That some knucklehead from Podunk can reach into the presidency. Who the hell are you? You got three hundred and thirty million colleagues out there who have an equal voice. Your your office doesn't give you a louder voice on these questions, and to assert one is a threat to the order. Now, my view, this is more of a threat to the constitutional order than that little parade of knuckleheads with the guy with the horns and all of that on January 6th. If this is allowed to go down, you have to understand that there's a hand of real power behind this that is about as close to shedding the cloak of constitutional government as you can get without just ripping it in half and standing naked. And I think that there's some people that see that, too. They're like, look, are we going into that phase? I mean, do we start putting the armbands on now and stuff and practice that goose step thing? And also, from what I understand, that um, the Biden regime is getting ready to round up like 1,200 more January 6th protesters. You know? It's just... It's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I just think, like, is there a statute of limitations? Because I don't know how many times I've been, like, there protesting and calling for almost exactly the same thing. You know, I told um, Dakota, we would have died to have that many people to be able to surround the Congress and demand, our, demand that they at least listen right. to our grievances, right? Right, because yep. They, because they don't. Right. And so anyway, that's also a little bit off of the off of the subject, but not really. I, you know, not I, really. If you're talking about armbands. Yeah. You that's know, right. you can't the, the the First Amendment protects what they were doing. Yep. And so that you know, it's almost the 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 Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights, practically irrelevant at that point. When you can hold people without charge or trial uh, for years and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, it's just really, really super incredible. And we could see, like, maybe if it were a federal prosecutor in Manhattan, you know, kind of, um, kind of like doing this. But he's not even like the state uh, attorney general. Right. He's not even the New York state attorney general. Now, let's compare this case. Okay, and and I, I guess I, you know we covered the circus around uh, President Putin, so we'll leave that. Let's move on. Let's find some actual criminal activity that everyone, if you look, examine the facts, will agree. In fact, uh, is is full of provable criminal activity, and the consequence of which is many, more than a million, people died. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we're talking about multi-million number of individual murder indictments. Okay, so back about, uh, it's going to be 13 years this year, 2012, in Kuala Lumpur, remember that? They had the... Um, war crimes trial of George Bush and Rumsfeld and Cheney and Gonzalez and Addington, Haynes, Bybee and John Yu. Mm -hmm. They were tried in absentia, in absentia, excuse me, I always make that faux pas, in Malaysia. 
I remember I'll tell that. You your math is bad. When did you say it happened? In 2012. That's 11 years ago. I'm sorry. You, you said 13. <laughs> yeah, I keep thinking I, I rounded to 2025. I, I'm still a little fuzzy. I've had the flu for about nine oh, yeah, days now. Let's get it. Let's get out of this blooping year. <laughs> yeah, I'm hip. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, so, yeah, 2012. So, actual, you know, Kuala Lumpur is the capital of Malaysia, which is a, an actual nation state uh, recognized member of the, the United Nations, etc. They got their official badge. And, and and everything, a little Dakota ring, whatever. Uh -huh, yeah, this right. is a, 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 a national government. They held the war crimes trials under existing international law, following established international procedures. They left out the one, let's go ask Washington for permission. Uh -huh. Otherwise, they followed it to the letter. Nuremberg, ICC. There was eyewitness testimony from victims of torture suffered at the hands of U.S. soldiers and contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, including an ex-Guantanamo detainee um, and an Iraqi woman who was tortured in Abu Ghraib. At the end of the week-long hearing, the five-panel tribunal unanimously delivered guilty verdicts against Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and their key legal advisors. They were all convicted as war criminals for torture and cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. Full transcripts of those charges, witness statements, and video of the entire proceeding, by the way, which I witnessed from my desk here in New York when it took place was sent to the chief prosecutor of the ICC, to the UN, and the UN Security Council. They also asked that the names of Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Gonzalez, you, Bybee, Addington, and Haynes be entered in and included in the Commission's Register of War Criminals, which is the, the uh, public record, official public record of war criminals. The tribunal was the initiative of the retired Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mahathir Mohammed. I don't know. You, you know him. I mean, you probably know him personally, too, I think. No, I don't think. I don't know. Maybe. Cynthia knows him. So, and yeah. uh, he sat through the entire hearing. It took personal statements and testimony of three witnesses, heard uh, two other statutory declarations of two other witnesses, um, Iraqis and Brits. And uh, 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 Mohammed, Matahir Mohammed said at the end of it, uh, powerful countries are getting away with murder. Um, attorney Francis Boyle uh, was part of the prosecution team. Right. And he said at the end of the case, this is the first conviction of these people anywhere in the world. While the hearing is regarded by some as purely symbolic, he said he was hopeful that Bush and company could find themselves facing similar trials elsewhere in the world. Well, guess what? Nobody else has taken up that banner. And as a matter of fact, the United States government at the time said, you know what, if anybody does, we're going to bomb the hell out of you. They made it illegal for any court or any prosecutor anywhere in the world to try to indict U.S. officials or military for war crimes. Right. Well, I mean, who was president at the time? Major war criminal, yeah. Barack Obama. A, a war criminal with his own Nobel Peace Prize. Right, <laughs> exactly. If I were a war criminal, I probably wouldn't like want that going I, on either. Yeah, it's a chunk of change that comes with it, first of all. You know, you could open an account down at the ice cream parlor for the kiddies with the money, you know. There's a lot of uses you can find for it. Maybe a college fund for the kiddies. Um, you for know, all of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They'd go to Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or Stanford. Yeah, or both. <laughs> so, right. yeah, so that, it's part, this actually happened with, that's with um, the people I just named. Of course, aside from being a war criminal for doing what we just described, in other words, trying to shield these war criminals from justice, I'm going to say trying, he did shield them from justice. Um, Obama, of course, committed his own war crimes. From the complicity in the uh, terrorist campaign that, that led to a coup d'etat in Côte d'Ivoire, 
the coup d'etat in Côte d'Ivoire. I like that. <laughs> I should write a song like that. And, um, <laughs> and uh, then, of course, the destruction of the Libyan state and the murder of, of uh, Muammar Gaddafi and thousands of others in the process of that. Um, uh, the backing of the Saudis in the takeover of the, the coup uh, in Bahrain and the suppression of a pop- an actual popular uprising contemporaneous with the so-called Arab Spring, the war on Syria that continues to this day, mm-hmm. that only a small rogue group of Republicans, and only just now, have even opened their mouth about in, in the last 11 years, <laughs> um, that's t- made more than 10 million people refugees, taken thousands of lives and by the way gave rise to an illegal occupation of a chunk of syria that continues today right Uh, and then the uh, war crime uh the genocide in yemen yeah uh was started under obama but uh the u.s and israel support saudi arabia Mm -hmm. in that in that genocide yeah i mean it's just like the crimes that we're talking about are like global they're they're just so vast in scope you know and so maybe if we can find some hush money that that these guys paid to somebody then we can get like maybe the um County Attorney of Tulare County to have a, a trial in Pixley. I'm. I want to say I misspoke. Hooterville is not real. Okay. Pixley is real. That's but okay. We like. I. I was there, and there must have been some kind of like Hooterville General Store thing that I that they were capitalizing on. Gotcha. I would too. Shows or whatever. Well, um, Don, I think we should probably wrap it up because you're. You know, you've been talking a long time and. You know, it sounds like you need to rest your voice and your lungs. Okay, one quick wrap-up then. Yeah. Uh, if it's okay. No, um, of course. Yeah. It's up uh, to you. You know, uh, I mean, we have to that include it. fine. We, we have to include, <laughs> we have to include it in uh, someone having the courage to, uh, to try to reach some sort of accountability, even if it requires something approaching the level of cobbling together that this chucklehead in, in Manhattan is trying to do. Um, on the question of World War III. Right. I mean, right now, we're having, we're at war with Russia, and they're saying if you get much deeper, we're going to be having one of them knockdown drag out ones with the mushroom clouds are popping and all of that, and these knuckleheads, their response is, good. They roll up their sleeves and they dig deeper into the mud. Somebody should mention that, too, which would mean that uh, Joe Biden... Is a war criminal who is still on the loose. 100%. And that needs to be taken off the loose fast, whether it's a straight jacket or, or, or God knows what else. I won't advocate anything, of course, but other than due process and in a damn hurry. Well, and, and, one of the things that Trump has said, and, you know, most of the things he says, I just like, I, I just think whatever. But... He said in a recent campaign speech or whatever, you know, he has these rallies that uh, the U.S. better stop this meddling in Ukraine before it devolves into World War III. Yeah, he's on it. He's definitely. And so he, you know, this is like one of the reasons that he is so hated. They're they're afraid that they're going to take away their power, but. You know, the the military-industrial complex, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, they, like, are not to be screwed with. Take You have to take a look at the material uh, in the case against him for the first impeachment now. If you read that stuff now, you'll understand how he was and is actually a threat. His crime was trying to rein in the ukraine and and thereby uh illustrate what actually happened there in 2014 right and instead that truth was turned into a trump fantasy and the fantasy that we're hearing about ukraine became the official truth 
they placed Biden, whether he rode it in or was driven in on that you know, upside down turn, placing him at the levers of power and he began conducting the war almost immediately, taking us right here. If you read that stuff now, you're going to be like, oh. In other words, Trump isn't just some crazy uncle that was saying some stuff that, that you know, angered them. He, in fact, raised a fundamental question of contradiction to their power. I don't know if it's factions or what, but the people who are making policy have decided it's time to have the war with Russia. Well, and he was saying too, no. He was saying another, no. Another couple things he did. He exposed the Russiagate uh, yep. lie. Yep. And also, uh, this isn't what Trump did, but one of the reasons Putin is on their, their grill is because he stepped in in Syria. If Russia yep. and Putin hadn't stepped in in Syria, right. it would be completely obliterated along the lines of Libya right. or Iraq or Afghanistan. Right. They saw, they, saw, they saw Putin up until 2007, really, but certainly by 2011, they saw Putin as the second uh, Yeltsin administration. And that's how he came to power was through that. Right, 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 right. right. And, and so Good they point. were that's fine with him doing a number. Excellent of, point, yeah. And, and then what happened was two, two, two things he uh, cut the strings, you know, the puppet strings. One was he started taking back, he, he basically took back Rosneft, that the Russian oil company that, that we let come into the hands of this group of oligarchs that have this group of Americans and Brits and others as partners in the you know laying in the background, we're taking that back. That's going to be an instrument of state power in the country. That was the first big sin. And the second was when he stood up against NATO in Georgia, when he said, "You guys are not going to play around at our borders." And he, they militarized it, the, you know, from the other side, and they militarized the defense of that. Uh, Ukraine then, oh then then they sat for the China too. Sat for the resolution in 2011 against Libya, and which which Obama contorted out of all form, into from a no-fly zone turned it into a bombing campaign from March 20th to October 20th daily, 11, 12 hours a day, every city. Right. And when they started off on the second bombing campaign to do that in Syria to support, you had U.S. trained um, you know jihadis basically Al Qaeda, Al Nusra, all these others. Yeah, on the ground in in both places, the aerial support that was given to them in Libya was decisive. As they started to falter in Syria, they went made the same kind of moves. Oh, he's going to bomb his citizens, blah 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 blah, chemical weapons, etc. Except his own they, yeah, yada, exactly. Yada, yada. So, so they come back to the UN for authority for another no fly zone, and China and Russia both, not one or the other tag team, but both vetoed it saying enough no more of this stuff and that day he became public enemy number one and they went after aggressively went after ukraine up to 2013 2014 they took ukraine in 2014 february and immediately russia invaded ukraine and we are going to sanction russia into oblivion and i'd say it was april i think march or april what happened was China basically said, all right, we get it. After decades going back to Kissinger and Nixon of tripolar politics or whatever, if you want to call it that, it wasn't really, but um, mm -hmm. China shows up sides with Russia against the United States, understanding that they're taking you, they're coming for me next. Right. Now Xi is uh, saying that he would broker a ceasefire. Yep. And the United States is saying, no way. That's right. You know, monsters, yep. just complete monsters. Yep. But thank God for Albert Bragg yeah. of New York County, who is uh, stepping in to, what did that guy say? Hold um, Trump accountable for his absolute anarchy and tyranny. Gosh, bless him. Yep. That's right. That that's the important thing. Get Trump. Get Trump. Yep. Well, Don, thank you so much for coming on short notice to talk about this this subject, and we uh, hope you 
feel better and get completely well. And is there like some place you'd like to direct the, our listeners to uh, to get more information about what you're doing? Yeah, I, I'm still like one foot in bed and I'm too lazy to cook. Could somebody come over and make me breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, just, I just finished a 30-day stint in the Facebook jail again. Oh, uh, this happened, not so coincidentally, uh, four days before the, or the two days before the uh, February 19th uh, anti-war rally in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, the evening after, you know, the, the evening after the uh, March 18th rally in Washington, D.C., where I was one of the minority voices arguing these groups need to join each other and everybody should go to both rallies because we need to do that. So I was removed from that conversation by uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Well, I was completely removed from either event. I think that I'm being ghosted from my own movement and yeah um, they got techniques you know so i don't really care and i just think like okay (sighs) millions of people went out on um february 15th 2003 millions like multi-millions all over the world i remember and how many rallies have we had in the past 20 years and i just saw video about the people of iraq talking 20 years later Yep. You know, their their lives are completely destroyed. We're still and destroying them. Yeah, absolutely. The, if you think the Obama ended the war, I'm not talking about you. I know. If anybody listening thinks that Obama ended that war, they're they're just like ridiculous. They're they're thinking in um, this magical thinking, but you know, yeah. But here we are. Like, we can't even get our crap together to demand an end to these wars, to um, demand accountability. There's factional fighting, there's jealousies, there's, oh, you know, she's not vaccinated, or she talks weird about COVID, so we don't want her. (laughs) Everything. (laughs) every, Every possible. We are divided down to the social security number. It's amazing. And so I just kind of had just got to do what we can do that's right? right that's and right so you we all are doing what we can do where we are but you know you know we can't the people of iraq don't have electricity many parts of the day like we we talked about their children are dying their babies are being born with the deformities and you know oh gosh you know this guy said this like 13 years ago so we can't you know right. include them or she or whatever so i don't know i've just kind of had it yeah so, all right so I, I i mentioned that to say I, i'm back on facebook so you can follow my work there and on okay. twitter <laughs> don debar and um and, and on vk.com it's like victor carl vk.com uh, and uh, truthsocial.com that's trump's thing i'm, I'm on all of those okay. and and youtube yeah. All uh, right, Don. Well, thank you so much. I love you. Love you too. And we love you and thank hope you. you get better. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for this edition of The Soapbox. As always, I hope you were informed and inspired to do further research or activism. As always, I'd like to thank Don DeBar, uh, my guest and my engineer for this episode. And I'd like to thank you for listening. I'm Cindy Sheehan. You've been listening to The Soapbox. Peace out for now.